Yep, hey my relatives, this is Mark Charles. I am speaking to you today from my home in Washington, D.C. And I want to wait just a few more minutes for some people to get on. We just started this live stream. But uh, I wanted to say something today, especially because of the fact that uh, today is the 129th anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee, as well as the fact that there was a stabbing in New York in the Jewish community at a Hanukkah celebration last night, and a shooting of two more people, of, of several people in Texas at uh, church this afternoon. So we'll wait just a few more minutes, maybe a minute or two, to allow for more people to get onto this live stream. And then we'll be starting in just a moment. Okay, we have about five or almost ten people who are watching now. So, yeah, hey, my relatives, Mark Charles, you know, yeah. Sin beke denan is lent the toy blingy bashi chin. Sin beke denan bashi chay the toy chini bashi nala. As I do almost every place that I speak around the country, I like to introduce myself traditionally before I say anything. Uh, as you've heard me say, or maybe you haven't, that in the Navajo tradition, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. And because we're matrilineals of people, our identities come from our mother's mother, and my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, which is why I say Tsimbike Dene. Translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohibli, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbeke Dene. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Tohibli, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans or Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge today that I'm live streaming from Washington, D.C., which is the traditional land of the Piscataway. Um, I want to honor the Piscataway as the traditional, the indigenous nation um, to these lands. It was their nation that farmed here, they fished here, they hunted here, they raised their families here, they buried their dead here, their lives, their livelihood was here. And they were the nation that was removed and oppressed so that the Washington District of Columbia could be built as well as uh, the states of Maryland and Virginia could be established. And it's important to acknowledge, no matter where we go around Turtle Island, um, the indigenous nations and peoples who were on these lands long before Columbus got lost at sea. We need to constantly remind ourselves that the history of Turtle Island, the history of North America, did not begin with um, Europeans landing here, but there was an oral history. There was a history long before that time happened, and there was a lot of uh, injustice that happened in order to create space that the Europeans did to, to colonize these lands and eventually to complete their manifest destiny. And when we do not acknowledge the land, when we do not acknowledge the stories that predate what's in our history books, then we forget and uh, we perpetuate the myth of this nation. And the myth was that this country was discovered, these lands were discovered, which is not possible to do. Next, I would like to have a moment of silence. Last night in New York City, there was a horrific stabbing of people at a Hanukkah celebration in New York City. And uh, many people are in the hospital this morning. And then this afternoon there was a shooting um, at a church in Texas. And I want to start this live stream just by having a moment of silence for the people who both died as well as were injured or wounded in these attacks. And I, I just want us to begin with a moment of silence. So if we can re observe a moment of silence for both the people in New York, the Jewish community in New York, as well as for the congregants of the church in Texas that were um, the recipients of this violence uh, earlier today. Thank you, my relatives. 
Now, I want to talk about the massacre at Wounded Knee. Today, uh, Sunday, January 29th, is the 129th anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee. Uh, in this massacre, anywhere between 150 and 300 Lakota men, women, and children were slaughtered by the U.S. Army in a single day. Uh, this was one of the final, I said, sorry, in December of, uh, December 29 of 2000, sorry, December 29 of 1890 was the date of the massacre. And um, it was one of the, the worst massacres um, in the history of our nation. And it was also one of the final massacres uh, that happened. Not the last one, but one of the final ones that, that happened. And our nation has never really known how to talk about this history or what to do with this history. And over the past century, a lot of documentation of this, of this massacre has taken place. Uh, Dee Brown wrote about it very well in his book, um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Many other authors and historians and lecturers have spoken about this history and laid out the gruesome details. I actually have blogged about the, this massacre many times over the past decade, and I included a section on this massacre in our book uh, that I published with my good friend Sung Chan Ra just about uh, a month and a half ago called Unsettling Truths. I've been also to South Dakota. I've been to the lands of uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation. And I've, I've been there, and I've been at the site where the massacre took place, and it's a very humbling site. It's, it's a very peaceful site, but when you stop to think about the history, it's very unsettling, and it, it's very difficult to be there. And last fall, I was there again after I had a campaign event on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and I went there um, to the site of the Wounded Knee Massacre. And at the site of the massacre, there is a, a billboard and on the billboard is written in, in the words of the Dakota people, of the Lakota people, the, the narrative of that massacre and what happened there. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that our nation needs to create a common memory and find a way to deal with our history. We need to allow the voices of those who have been oppressed to be elevated and heard. A few years ago, I went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place in Canada regarding the residential schools. And one of the things that impressed me most about that event was at the Truth and Reconciliation, they had a very large conference, and they had very large stages set up. And anyone who was a boarding school survivor or the ancestor of a boarding school survivor could sign up and speak from the main platform of the conference and they could go forward and tell the story of their family, of what happened to their ancestors, even themselves, while they were in the boarding school. And at this conference, there were also commissioners who were there, there were representatives from the churches, as well as representatives from the government. And they were not allowed to speak. They sat and they listened to these stories. They were not able to justify themselves, they were not able to explain themselves, they were not able to make excuses for what happened, but they had to sit there and listen to these stories. Sometimes they went on for hours, other times the whole conference went on for days at a time. And survivor after survivor, ancestor after ancestor, grandchild after grandchild came forward and shared these gut-wrenching stories of what happened to them and to their families in these boarding schools. And at the end of the conference, they opened up a space and they allowed the people who were listening to speak. But they, again, they could not justify themselves. They could not explain themselves. They could not excuse what they had done. But the only things they were allowed to say was commitments of reconciliation. Now that they had heard this history, now that they had understood what took place, now that they had seen what was enacted through the eyes of the people who were on the receiving end of this violence, what were they now going to do to ensure that this would never happen again? What statements, commitments of reconciliation were they going to make to make sure something like this never happened again? It was very powerful to sit there and to watch this process take place. And it was amazing to even hear and see the healing that was beginning to start 
as the people who were oppressed through these boarding schools came forward and had the courage to tell the story. One of the narratives that I heard most frequently throughout my time there listening to these stories was usually someone my age would come forward and they would say something to the effect of my grandmother, my grandfather, was in a boarding school and they survived. But they were very wounded and they, they abused my mother and my mother abused me. And they would say, I am now standing on this stage, sharing the story of what happened to our family because I just had my first son or I had my first daughter or I had my first child. And I want to ensure that this system of abuse, this cycle of abuse does not move forward. And so I am sharing the story to begin the process of healing. There is something very healing about allowing the victim to speak. And there is something equally and just as important of requiring the perpetrator to listen. Not to excuse themselves, not to justify themselves, but to hear the horror of what happened. Now I know many throughout our country would say, well, I wasn't there, I wasn't a part of Wounded Knee, I wasn't the person pulling the trigger. No, you may not have been that. In fact, you weren't that person who was there. But it was battles like this, genocidal actions like this, that allowed this nation to complete its manifest destiny so that it could rule these lands from sea to shining sea. So while you may not have been there pulling the trigger and enacting this violence, if you live in the United States of America today, you have most definitely benefited from this violence. And that needs to be acknowledged. We cannot pretend like that is not the case, that that is not true. And so it is important for all Americans to sit and to allow the voices of those who were oppressed to be heard. As I thought about how to commemorate this day, I considered reading a part of the chapter from my book. I have considered reading a part of the chapter from, from uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and to tell this story. But I thought, as I pondered this longer, that the most appropriate way to commemorate this day would be to listen to the voices of the Lakota people themselves as they tell the story. And so I spent the morning at my computer. When I was there last a few months ago, I took pictures of the billboard. And I, I, it, it, there's a, probably a thousand words on this billboard. I don't know exactly, but there's several paragraphs of transcript. And I, I pulled up those pictures on my computer this morning, and I transcribed them onto my computer. And I posted them into a blog that I shared on my campaign webpage, markcharles2020.com, under the blog section. And what I would like to do now is I would like to read the words of that billboard. And I want to invite you to listen to them. Please do not justify yourself. Please do not excuse it or explain it or try to make it go away. But I encourage you to sit and to listen and to lament the genocide that was enacted so that this nation, the United States of America, could be established. On December 29, 1890, Chief Bigfoot, with his mini Kanju and Hunk Papa Sioux Band of 106 warriors, 250 women and children were encamped on this flat surrounded by the U.S. 7th Cavalry, 470 soldiers commanded by Colonel Forsyth. The Messiah craze possessed many Indians who left the vicinity of the agencies to ghost dance during the summer and fall of 1890. Unrest on the Pine Ridge Reservation was partly due to the reduction of beef rations by Congress and to the ghost dancing of Chief Sitting Bull, Hump, Bigfoot, Kicking Bear, and Short Bull. The Sioux were told by Kicking Bear, sorry, my screen. 
The Sioux were told by Kicking Bear and Short Bull that wearing ghost shirts, the ghost dancing warriors would become immune to the white man's bullets and could openly defy the soldiers and the white settlers and bring back the old days of the big buffalo herds. On November 15, 1890, Indian agent Royer, Lakota Wokopa, at Pine Ridge called for troops, and by December 1, 1890, several thousand U.S. regulars were assembled in this area of Dakota Territory. On December 15, 1890, Chief Sitting Bull was killed by Lieutenant Bullhead of the Standing Rock Indian Police. Forty of Sitting Bull's braves escaped from Grand River and joined Chief Bigfoot's band on Deep Creek to camp and ghost dance on the South Fork of the Cheyenne River. Chief Bigfoot was under close scrutiny of Lieutenant Colonel Sumner and his troops, and on December 23, 1890, they were ordered to arrest Bigfoot as a hostile. However, the Bigfoot band was already silently slipped away from the Cheyenne County into the Badlands, heading for Pine Ridge. On December 28, 1890, without a struggle, Chief Bigfoot surrendered to the U.S. 7th Cavalry, Mount Whiteside, Major Whitesides, at the site marked by a sign five miles north of here. The band was then escorted to Wounded Knee, camping that night under guard. Reinforcements of the U.S. 7th Cavalry, including one company of Indian scouts, arrived at Wounded Knee from Pine Ridge Agency the morning of December 29, 1890. Colonel Forsyth took command of a force of 470 men. A battery of four Hotchkiss guns was placed on the hill 400 feet west of here, overlooking the Indian encampment. Bigfoot's band was encircled at 9 a.m. by a line of foot soldiers and cavalry. Big Chief Bigfoot, sick with pneumonia, lay in a warm tent provided by Colonel Forsyth in the center of the camp. A white flag flew there, placed by the Indians. In the, directly in the rear of the Indian camp was a dry draw, draw running east and west. The Indians were ordered to surrender their arms before proceeding to Pine Ridge. Captain Wallace, with an army detail, began searching the teepees for hidden weapons. During this excitement, Yellowbird, a medicine man, walked around among the braves, blowing on an eagle bone whistle, inciting the warriors to action, declaring that the ghost shirts worn by the warriors would protect them from the soldiers' bullets. A shot was fired, and all hell broke loose. The troops fired a deadly volley into the council warriors, killing nearly half of them. A bloody hand-to-hand -hand struggle followed as um, a bloody hand-to-hand -hand struggle followed, all the more desperate since the Indians were armed mostly with clubs, knives, and revolvers. The Hotchkiss guns fired two-pound explosive shells on the groups, indiscriminately killing warriors, women, children, and their own disarming soldiers. Soldiers were killed by crossfire of their comrades in this desperate engagement. Surviving Indians stampeded into, in wild disorder for the shelter of the draw 200 feet to the south, escaping west and east in the draw and north down Wounded Knee Creek. Pursuit by the 7th Cavalry resulted in the killing of more men, women, and children, causing this battle to be referred to as the Wounded Creek Massacre. One hour later, 146 Indian men, women, and children lay dead in the Wounded Knee Creek Valley. The bodies of many were scattered along a distance of two miles from the scene of the encounter. Twenty soldiers were killed on the field, and 16 later died of wounds. Wounded soldiers and Indians alike were taken to Pine Ridge Agency. A blizzard came up. Four days later, an army detail gathered up the Indian dead and buried them in a common grave at the top of the hill northwest of here. A monument marks this grave. Ghost dancing ended with this encounter. The Wounded Knee Battlefield is the site of the last armed conflict between the Sioux Indians and the United States Army. Delineator Irving R. Pond and Herbert H. Clifford, and this was by Stanley S. Walker, Superintendent of Highway Engineer, Engineers, it is their names located at the bottom of the billboard.
This is incredibly challenging to know what to do with this history. There is a bill before the U.S. Congress that is titled, let me read the exact name of it, that is titled House Resolution 3467. It's the Remove the Stain Act. The purpose of this bill is to rescind the 20 medals of honor that were awarded to U.S. soldiers who participated in this massacre at Wounded Knee. You heard me correct. There were 20 medals of honor awarded by the U.S. Congress to soldiers who participated in this massacre. In research that I've done, I found the names of three of these soldiers, Aust William G. Austin, John C. Gresham, and Albert W. McMillan, and they were awarded medals of honor specifically for flushing the Lakota people out of the ravine so they could be shot and killed by the guns that were up high. As a candidate for the office of President of the United States, I fully support House Resolution 3467 remove the Stain Act. It is disgraceful that the United States of America and our Congress chose to celebrate and honor genocide and ethnic cleansing. That type of honor, that type of celebration has no place in a civilized society. I fully support the Remove the Stain Act and the rescinding of these 20 medals of honor. Second, as president, if I am elected president, I will honor the Lakota people and lament this massacre by ordering the United States flag to be flown at half staff on December 29th. The flag is flown at half-staff several times throughout the year. It's usually for three different occasions. One, which is the death of a prominent government figure. Sometimes it's flown at half-staff for the death of a foreign dignitary. Sometimes it's flown at half-staff. It's always flown at half-staff for 30 days at the death of a former president. And other times it's flown at half-staff when there is something the nation needs to mourn or remember. In 2018, it was flown at half-staff multiple times because of different massacres and mass killings that happened in our nation through gun violence. And so I think it would be entirely appropriate for the President of the United States on December 29th to order that the flag of the United States be flown at half-staff as a way to honor the people who were killed in this massacre and a way to demonstrate that the United States of America no longer celebrates nor does it honor ethnic cleansing and genocide. We need to find a way to create a common memory. We need to find a way to deal with our history. We need to find a way to talk about this history we don't know how to talk about. The United States of America needs to find a way to lament. Yes, it was 129 years ago that this horrific genocidal act took place by the U.S. military. But today, 129 years later, we have another horrific violent act in the church. And another, last night, what appears to be a hate-filled act of mass violence in a Jewish community while some of our Jewish citizens and brothers and sisters were celebrating Hanukkah and the lighting of the seventh candle last night. 
Our nation needs to find a way to deal with its past. We need to find a way to deal with our history. George Erasmus, an elder from the Diné people in Canada, says that where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same path, there can be no real community. Where communities to be formed, he says, common memory must be created. I so deeply appreciate the wisdom of that statement. The United States of America does not have a common memory. Even if you look at the month of December alone, a month that most of this nation spent celebrating and engrossed in consumerism. And yet, this was not even the only anniversary of a massacre. On December 26th, the day after Christmas, we had another anniversary of the hanging of the Dakota 38, ordered by Abraham Lincoln after the Dakota Wars and the beginning of the ethnic cleansing of the Dakota and Winnebago and other tribes from the state of Minnesota as Abraham Lincoln was clearing the way for the Transcontinental Railway to be completed. And before Christmas, on December 19th, this year was the was the, 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 the tenth anniversary of the signing of the bill. On December 19, 2009, Congress passed and President Obama signed House Resolution 3326. This was the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act, a 67-page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. Page 45, subsection 8113 was titled Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What followed was a seven bullet point apology. It mentioned no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. Even the massacre at Wounded Knee and the hanging of the Dakota 38 did not make a specific mention in that apology. It basically said natives had some nice land. U.S. citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now just call it all of our land and steward it together, and then it ended with a disclaimer stating nothing in here is legally binding. Neither Congress nor the Obama White House saw fit to publicize and read that apology nationally. And to date, that apology has not been read or announced by the White House or by Congress. Our nation does not have a common memory. In fact, you might even say the United States of America has a willful and intentional ignorance because it does not know how to deal with its history. It does not know to, what to do with the, the land that we're standing on. This is why almost no one in politics does a land acknowledgement when they speak. This is why the democratic debates that have taken place in sites all around this country have not had a land acknowledgement at a single one of their debates. A nation doesn't know what to do with this history doesn't have a common memory. And this is why I'm running for president. I am convinced we need to create this common memory. I am convinced we need to teach this history. I am convinced we have to learn how to deal with our past if we ever want to have any hope of moving forward in a healthy way into a future. This is why I wanted to read the story of this narrative today to allow the words of the Lakota to be heard and to be spoken. And I want to invite all Americans to listen to these words. Not to make excuses, not to justify, but to hear these words and to lament the genocide that was enacted so that our nation could be established. 
But yeah, my relatives, thank you so much for joining this live stream today. I appreciate the time that you took. Let me look to see if there's any comments that need to be addressed right now. I'm going to be doing more of these live streams as we move into the future. As we move into 2020, my campaign is going to begin to do more to put my voice and my perspective out into the public realm. Unfortunately, mainstream media is not picking up my campaign. Unfortunately, um, the nation hasn't, this has, <laughs> mainstream media has decided not to publicize um, uh, statements I put out and, and campaign events that I have. And so we're going to be using the internet and our, this, this channel on our YouTube uh, more frequently to put out statements like this and to have times of gathering like this to have times of lament, to have times of teaching, to lay out policies, and even to have Q&As and to ask and answer questions. So I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Mark Charles 2020. I also encourage you to go onto my website, Mark Charles 2020, under the blog section of our website. You will find that, you will find the blog article that I just read to you, including the story um, that was written on the billboard in South Dakota. And I also want to encourage you to go onto our website and if you are able to, make a donation to our campaign. As we move into 2020, we have a lot of activities, and a lot of invitations, and a lot of things we want to begin doing right away, even beginning next week and the week after that. We want to begin to publicize more of my campaign, to speak to more communities, to expand our audience, and to, to reach out more and more across the country. And we need donors, we need people to support this campaign. So I encourage you to go onto our website and to click um, the, do the donate buddy button and consider making a donation to our campaign today. Akihat, my relatives, it's been an honor to speak with you today. I hope that you will find this video helpful. I encourage you to share it. I encourage you to ponder it. I encourage you to go back and read it on my blog. I encourage you to look at other Native media and places that are lamenting this history today as well. And I encourage you to allow this experience to help create this common memory so that we can move forward in a more healthy way. I can't my relatives. Walk in beauty. Hakonet.